Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to ARC's weekly fireside chat. This week, we'll be talking about mental health. Uh, the month of May is Mental Health Awareness Month, and so today we want to highlight the importance of mental health during incarceration and reentry. We have some amazing guests, as usual, incredible human beings that are going to share different insights and experiences with you. And so, without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Ellen Goldwasser, ARC's Clinical and Wellness Director. Kathleen Polk, ARC member, Isaac Woods, ARC member, Douglas Jessup, ARC member, and Gary Burt, ARC member, and, and, drum roll, newly graduate, graduate, MSW, he was an MSW intern, or is an MSW intern in the Sacramento office, and is graduating from Sacramento State Project Rebound. Let's give it up for Gary. Uh, <laughs> we got to give it up for you, bro. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. It means a lot. Absolutely. And we're going to talk a little bit about that in a minute. But first, uh, Ellen, could you take a minute? How are you doing today? And could you inter introduce yourself and tell us your favorite form of self-care? Absolutely. Um, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, Sam. And thank you for hosting this really important conversation. Um, as Sam mentioned, I'm the clinical director at ARC. I'm a licensed clinical social worker. And um, I really value self-care. I think the best form of self-care for me is being able to get outside, get some fresh air, exercise, work out, and connect with other people. Thank you, Ellen. Uh, Catherine, could you introduce yourself? How are you doing today? And tell us your favorite form of self-care. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Catherine Pope. Uh, my favorite self-care is connecting with my family, uh, spending time with them. I go every Wednesday to visit my mother, who is 101, and I uh, cut her hair, do her nails. That's self-care for me because uh, I promised God and my mother that I would care for her uh, when she needed me. And that's one of the reasons why I'm home. Amen. Thank you, Catherine. Isaac, could you please introduce yourself? Tell us how you're doing today and what is your favorite form of self-care? What's up, man? I'm doing feeling pretty good. Uh, my favorite form of self-care is exercise and sports. <clears throat> Actually, right before this, I went to the gym with my buddy, got some work at work in. Uh, you know, just it's a it's a good way to, for me to get my competitive juices flowing in uh clear my mind a little bit and push myself thank you isaac love that uh douglas could you introduce yourself how are you doing today and tell us your favorite form of self-care yeah what's up so i'm doug man i i would say how i'm feeling today i'm excited I, i'm excited about this um my best form of self-care i would say is writing recovery and social work like i'm really into social justice work so it helps me a lot it helps give back all right. Thank you, Douglas. Gary, could you introduce yourself? How are you doing today? And tell us your favorite form of self-care. I am doing excellent, Sam. Uh, my favorite form of self-care is it's really mind, body and soul. But uh, it, every morning I start the day with a walk down the American River and, and just deep breathe and think about focus on what I got to get through, get done with a day and get through with and uh, just start the day focused like that. Awesome. Thank you, Gary. And my favorite form of self-care is actually twofold. One is, is uh, running and working out. But my favorite, favorite, favorite is riding my bike, that Harley. And I will be on a five-hour <laughs> ride head to Santa Cruz this evening, uh, having uh, five hours of self-care, going up there to meet up with some brothers from Barrio Shinitos and many other organizations for Life and Get Together. Uh, so I want to uh, jump right into this. Uh, uh, and, and, and I'll literally go, uh, Catherine, let's go to you first. And, uh, uh, what does mental, mental wellness look like to you? Uh, mental wellness looks like to me um, giving consciousness to my mind, to my thinking. I believe that... Um, in order to be mentally well or becoming mentally well, because it's a process. It just doesn't happen overnight. It is a process. Uh, 
is changing my mind, which causes my brain to change and think positive. Thinking positive thoughts, um, using positive affirmations. And, you know, and I started this when I was incarcerated, not knowing exactly um, what I was doing, but I knew that uh, it was the right thing in my spirit, you know, to begin to change my, my thought process about myself and the person that I was. So, you know, to me, that's, you know, that's beginning the process of mental wellness. When you, when you start to think about what you're thinking about, because if you don't start thinking about what you're thinking about, you continue to do the same things that you've always done. Okay. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, uh, Ellen, for you, what, what does mental wellness mean or look like to you? Sure. I think a part of mental wellness is tapping into your strengths, really being able to actualize and to realize your strengths, to be able to cope with life's everyday stressors in a positive way, and to really be able to have social connections. So whether that's positive friends, whether it's family members, whether it's a community like ARC, being able to connect with other people and to in some way contribute to the community. Thank you, thank you, Ellen. Uh, Isaac, for you, what does mental wellness mean or look like to you? Yes, sir, I'm gonna uh, build on what Gary said about connecting the mind, body, and soul, and just taking time out your day, out your week to connect those things. And that looks different for everybody, whether you know, meditate, you read, you write, uh, exercise, you know, all those things and more just, uh, taking the time to look inwardly and uh, finding, trying to find that peace and, you know, growth for yourself. Thank you, Isaac. Uh, Douglas, for you, what, what does mental wellness look like and, and mean to you? I would say, so mental, mental, mental wellness means to me, man, I would say vulnerability, courage and self-awareness. You know what I mean? Because a lot of the, the ugly feelings and the depression and things like that, it, it makes you, well, you become very aware of what's going on. You know what I mean? So I, I would say that. And then like exercise and stuff like that. Thank you, Douglas. Uh, I want to switch it up a little bit to, to you, uh, uh, Gary. Uh, the new the, the new, new graduate, MSW graduate. Uh, why is access to mental health care for everyone important to you? Um, first off, everyone deserves to be healthy. Um, it improves the lives of the individual. It improves the lives in the, of the family system, of the community that they're in. Um, you know, and I, you know, it's just being in tune with yourself and most of all, being honest with yourself, I think, um, you know, because we're the best at deceiving ourselves most of the time when, when things get bad. Um, and it's just, addressing those situations before it gets to the point where it's eating at you and uh, um, just getting it out there on the table and uh, addressing those issues, you know, like the, the anxiety and the depression and things that come up uh, over certain things. Thank you, Gary. Uh, I want to, I want to ask that same question to you, Ellen, but I want to add something to it. So first, uh, why is access to mental health care for everyone important to you? And what are some of the barriers to access to mental health treatment uh, or like, especially in, the, in communities of color that, that you're aware of? Thank you for that, Sam. Yeah, I, I think that um, in part it's important to me because I think, as Gary mentioned, it's critical for having healthy individuals and having a healthy society. And I think that in general, we've seen particularly over the last 16 months or so, that there are major, major disparities in healthcare. And um, mental health care is one of the biggest. And I think that not only financial barriers and a lack of quality providers and access to transportation and all of those things are major barriers, but also the fact that oftentimes therapy is thought of as a privilege. It's thought of as a privilege that you have to have money for, 
a privilege to have time for. And really thinking about prioritizing our mental health is critical. And I think that, you know, you spoke on barriers specifically in communities of color. It's also providers who look like you. There aren't a lot of, of mental health providers. There aren't a lot of clinicians who have lived experience. And I know we'll touch on that a little bit later, but also who, who look like the population that they're serving. Hmm. Maybe I should consider going into that field. I think I might be a pretty good therapist. Uh, I think I'm a good listener. Uh, so so I, I want to I wanna, uh, ask you the same thing, uh, Ms. Pope. Uh, why is uh, access to mental health care for everyone important to you? And do you know of any barriers that, that uh, especially in, in uh, communities of color that, that uh, exist to accessing mental health treatment? Oh, absolutely. And thank you for that question. Uh, I'm a home care provider. And uh, I'll have a, a range of uh, recipients uh, all over the Los Angeles area. Right now, I'm working with a gentleman um, who lives on Skid Row. And he's a paraplegic, and so that 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 mental stability and that and that health problem they, they go hand in hand. So it gives me you know a really good uh, look at what the needs are you know for people of color, especially you know uh, working in the area of home health care. Um, it's there's there's just it, it really makes me sad, you know, it really makes me sad. And to be honest, I don't know where to begin. You know, I'm a home care provider uh, and, and try to input the information uh, that they need to get the, the, the care that my recipients need. Uh, and it, it becomes a, a 24 hour um, race. You know, it really does. It becomes a 24 hour race. So uh, it, it, we really need to, we really need to, to work on, you know, the disparities uh, in our community. It, it, it's, it's really heartbreaking. You know, I know, you know, as for myself that this is, this is my purpose um, along with caring for my mother is to care for those who can't care for themselves, you know? Um, and so, hey, I have to keep myself mentally ready in order to help them. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pope. Um, uh, Douglas, I want to jump to you and, and ask you, uh, what are some of the barriers to accessing mental health, uh, again, especially in, in communities of color that you might be aware of? Accessibility. Like honestly, a lot of—I mean, a lot of the times people don't get to see a rehab, or get to see rehab counselor, therapist until they get locked up, and that's just the facts of it. So, like accessibility funding, um, and there just has to be an emphasis inside of it, and there really isn't. You know, we live in a society that's very, very strict on, hey, let's punish this person for whatever. Do you get what I mean? And then now let's go like glorify it. You know what I mean? It's accessibility funding, and then I mean, directive. To be honest. And then the vulnerability too. So that's right. the reason why I say vulnerability is because it's it's it mental health is it's it, it definitely takes courage to address it. Absolutely. Thank you, Douglas. Uh, 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 so so Gary and Isaac, uh, would you like to add anything to those barriers that, that have been mentioned? I, I mean, I would just say that uh, you know, when the calls made, the first people that show up is law enforcement and they're not really uh, equipped to dealing with that, you know, which, you know, you hear defund the police and stuff like that. It's putting more social workers out there on the streets to, to be on the front line to do to address these situations as well. I, Isaac, I'm going to change it up a little bit because Douglas kind of touched on this, but when I want uh, to uh, ask a different question. What needs to change? to make mental health services accessible to everyone. Uh, your thoughts on that? It's a good question. I don't really have the answer to it, to be honest. Um, what needs to change? I mean, uh, I just think the way that, uh, the way that it is accessible to people, it, 
it's uh like Ellen said earlier, she kind of took the words out of my mouth. Like people think you need money to, you know, have this 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 ability to to get mental health services. And you know, I've I've been blessed to obviously uh, work with her uh, here in SAC. So you know, it's a uh, it's different for everyone. But um, yeah, I don't really have an answer for that. I'm not sure what steps we need to be taking. Ellen, okay, thank thank you, Isaac. Ellen, Ellen what what needs to change uh, to make mental health services accessible to everyone? I think this is kind of getting into the topic around um, you know licensing and costs, but we we talk a lot about in the social work field. Um, reducing barriers and really prioritizing um, access to higher education for people with lived experience, having more people with lived experience in the field. Yet in, in social work school, once you go to social work school, if you have a background, you have to complete a background check for a lot of your practicum placements. You have to be approved in order to take a licensing exam. And so I think that a lot of those barriers in education and who becomes a therapist, who goes to school to become a therapist is really important. I think also funding, you know, I, I think Isaac touched on um, funding in, in communities. So there's no reason that we couldn't have funding for more community mental health centers and to have quality mental health care and services at those facilities. Thank you, Ellen. And, and uh, Michelle in our chat literally just said something that, that uh, definitely I think. Uh, so a lot of people are afraid to speak up for help for fear of losing their kids also. And and culturally, like, and, and oftentimes in, in communities of color, it's kind of taboo, like uh, man up or something like that. But it's not about man up, it's about understanding that the pressures of everyday life, therapy is something that can help you get to the next level at least in my opinion, from what I've, I've seen. Uh, I know many uh, very successful people, high level that have therapists. Uh, and it's like, almost like going to the dinner table. You're gonna eat dinner, it's something that you need to, to do. You, you, you need to eat, you need to address your mental health. So I think uh, culturally it's something that we have to work on dispelling the myth of like, it's taboo or it's bad. Uh, uh, look, wanna, wanna jump down to uh, Catherine. Uh, for a minute and ask, um, how important is it to have mental health providers who have experience in incarceration or have expertise in that field? And then I'm going to come back to Ellen and, and the rest of the panel. I'm sorry, Ms. would Bo you repeat that for me, please? How important is it to have mental health providers who have experienced incarceration or have expertise in that field? Well, you know, I know it's important, but I can remember a time um, when they we had pair of people, people that have experience um, different lifestyles, you know, drug abuse, uh, alcoholism, uh, you have you, and those people were able to uh, give their input and and become a part of uh, the network of helping those that needed help. You know, and it's like, you know, now there's incarceration, which is punishment, where it used to be, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, well, it wasn't, it wasn't punishment. Okay, I think we need to get back to that. You know, and this is one of the things that I see as I'm driving around LA, is a lot of um, a lot of people in our community have mental problems, you know, not just being homeless, but they they have mental problems. And we used to have mental hospitals. I remember that, you know, and I believe at one point they let all everybody, all the mental patients out of the hospitals and closed them down. So you know, we need to get back to people that have had these problems and have, you know, uh, I guess, come, come with um, sympathy and empathy and awareness of where they've been 
where they are and where they're going to help someone else. It's, it's wonderful to have a degree, you know, and I don't knock, you know, I don't knock the professionals that have gone to school, you know, and, and become psychologists and psychiatrists. But the, the lay people that have been there, those are the ones that need to step up, you know, and, and be, be the helper. And like she said, you know, you got to be licensed. You got to do this and that. You know, this is where the barriers are. Stopping us from helping each other. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Paul. Uh, Ellen, same question to you. How is it? How important is it to have mental health providers who have experienced incarceration and have expertise in the field of, of uh, reentry and incarceration? Thank you for that question, Sam. I think it's it's both really important to reduce those barriers to make it possible for people who are system impacted to be able to be in this field. And Gary can speak a little bit to his experience, but I think that programs like Project Rebound and Reemerging Scholars at Sac City provide really supportive services. There's not enough financial aid that's available for people who want to go back to school. Um, and not everyone is available, is aware of those services that are available. And so just promoting those services more, they're not at every school and every institution. California is pretty good about that with Project Rebound, but I think those um, services need to be more known and more available. As far as um, clinicians who um, are trained and are aware of some of the challenges that um, system impacted people face, it's really important. I've heard a lot of stories of people who have tapped into therapy um, out in the in the community or through their insurance provider and haven't gotten quality services. And so I think that that's really on the schools and the programs to make sure that they're training therapists in a way that is um, inclusive of the of the population who they're providing services to. And that's formerly incarcerated people that's communities of color, that's everyone who is gonna tap into services. And so really being culturally responsive in that way and um, absolutely including people who have the lived experience and reducing barriers in their um, continuing with their education and licensure. Thank you, Ellen. Uh, and literally, I wanna to jump to you, uh, uh, Gary, as, as Ellen said, uh, in your opinion, again, wanna highlight it, newly graduate MSW, uh, going into this field to to help people, uh, in your opinion, how important is it to have mental health providers who have experienced incarceration or have expertise in that field? I mean, lived experience is huge. It, it's uh, tremendous, but you know, it's, it, the wounded sometimes the wounded make the best healers. Um, but you can't rely on that alone. Uh, you know, everyone's experience is different. So, so they need to be able to integrate different therapies and different interventions in there. And that's where kind of like the professional side uh, of the stuff you pull from academia with your lived experience in there, um, you know, and, and just let them know that, you know, it's possible. It, it you know, never give up hope. Uh, give them that hope uh, when, when things are bad for them um, and just, you know, be that support, uh, you know, I, you can never uh, underestimate the power of community, you know, uh, with communities like uh, ARC and Project Rebound and things of that nature. Um, you know, we're all in this together and, and all, like I said, everyone's experience is different, but when you bring that professional side into things, um, it definitely helps with the healing process. Thank you for that, Gary, appreciate it. Uh uh, Doug, the same question to you. How important is, is it for mental health providers, just imagine mental health providers who have experienced incarceration and have actual expertise in the field of, of people that have been incarcerated? I, th I think it's really important, man. It's kind of like if I'm going to learn how to play basketball, I'm going to LeBron James. I'm not going to Wayne Gretzky. You know what I mean? So I think with, with people that have experience with incarceration, with mental health in its entirety, not just like one piece of it or even from a book, you know what I mean? It's kind of the same analogy of like, oh, I could read a book, but I don't know how to play basketball. So I get out there and play basketball. You know what I mean? So I think uh, it's a, a mixture of all of that put together. That's really important. 
And then beyond that, I think something else that's super like another key point to this is integrity. Do you know what I mean? Like the fact is, is that there are people out there that are exploiting individuals that have mental health issues because they can simply say, well, they don't know what they're talking about. So I think this is a definitely the avenue we need and we need to go down. And I mean, we're taking the right steps. But as far as like having people who are system impacted, that's paramount. S simple as that. You know what I mean? I'm not going to talk to somebody from Beverly Hills telling them about like why my life was so rough and how come my parents couldn't cope with different in extreme environments of being in the hood. Do you got to mean or being Polynesian? They're not going to have that experience. And if you don't have the passion for it to actually or even the empathy to understand it, it's going to go nowhere. So I think it's really important, man. Thank you for that, Douglas. And I, I like every now and then I will try to add a little levity. This is a, a pretty heavy topic. It's important, but I do want to add a little bit of levity. And uh, at the top of his comment, Douglas mentioned that he would go to LeBron and not Steph Curry after last uh, last this week's basketball game. Just wanted to point that out. I'm just teasing. I'm I, like I love both Steph and and uh, LeBron. So, uh, but just want to add a little levity to the conversation uh, for all those basketball fans out there. Uh, uh, both I, I want to uh, uh, go to both Ellen and, and uh, Gary on this one. And uh, what can we do? Uh, for our listeners and even as an organization to create more opportunities for system impacted people and social work. Uh, Ellen first and then uh, Gary. I'm sorry, Sam, could you repeat the question? What can we do both our listeners? Cause we have, we have a pretty expansive uh, number, different types of people that listen. What can we do to create more opportunities for system impacted people and social work? So both as an organization and then as for individuals that are operating. I think as an organization, ARC and other, you know, other organizations could sort of follow the lead as far as including um, social workers, practicum students um, who are who are training in the field in our programming. Um, our mental health department, our, our wellness department has um, generally about six MSW students, and those students complete their practicum with us and meet with our members and facilitate groups. And I think that's really, it's a critical exchange, not just for students to learn more about um, system impacted people and providing therapy services to them, but also for our members to learn more about what the program is like and understand different opportunities and how to get involved. Um, I think, again, also it's about financial barriers, it's about licensing barriers, and that's something that we talk a lot about at ARC in the professional fields is we need to reduce those licensing barriers for people who do want to become clinicians. Um, and that's something that needs to be taken up with the Board of Behavioral Sciences and um, have less, less stringent requirements if we want to have people with lived experience who are providing services in the field. Yeah. And and I uh, want to go, thank you for that, Ellen. And want to go to you, you, Gary, but I also want to highlight the fact that one, Gary's an ARC member. He's also part of Project Rebound. He just graduated. He interned in the Sacramento office. And so when we, we, everything that uh, Ellen just described is part of what we're doing, but I also want that, in, that look from, from your perspective, Gary, uh, what more can we do to create more opportunities for system impact to people in social work? So, it, you know, you, we hear all this lived experience, the importance of lived experience, um, you know, and, it, you know, we just got to start with advocating, you know, um, you know, NASW's uh, the uh, Rehabilitation and Inclusion Board, you know, get them involved and in, in, uh, part of the process, like we put the work in, um, you know, we've done X, Y, and Z to prove that we have changed our old way of thinking, our old behavior and everything else. And, uh, I'd, you know, just give a shot, shout out to the policy team, you know, removing those barriers to licensure. Um, you know, I was did a little bit of homework that, you know, SB uh, 731 that they're looking at right now um, to kind of, you know, streamline uh, those people with lived experience who have come along and done the work and, uh, you know, want to make a difference in the field give them that opportunity. Gary, thank you for that. Uh, and so, yeah, uh, Senate Bill 731 uh, is sunset for convictions. And so, in other words, uh, literally eliminating all past convictions. Uh, 
And so I think that's something, be aware of policies that are being passed. And as an organization seeking to actually pass policies that will eliminate barriers to these licensing uh, issues that uh, Ellen earlier described. Uh, Isaac, uh, wanna, Isaac, I wanna jump to you for a minute and ask you, uh, uh, how would mental health treatment early on prevent pathways to incarceration for people with uh, mental health di disorders? In your opinion, how would it be? How would it help to prevent? I would say uh, treatment early on, so like you know, at younger ages, would uh, create like awareness and uh, the tools needed to deal with uh, possible struggles and temptations that will lead you to being incarcerated down in the future. So yeah, just it'll create awareness and uh, strength for those tools to be uh, exercised when needed. Thank you, Isaac, appreciate it. Uh, Ms. Polk, I wanna ask you the same question. How could mental health treatment early on prevent uh, pathways to incarceration for people with mental health disorders? That's a, that's a heavy question. You know, um, when I was incarcerated, uh, I was given the opportunity, I was in Hawaii, I was given the opportunity to go into um, Hawaiian uh, University in Manoa and speak to uh, the law class there. And I can also remember when I was incarcerated at FCI Dublin, where women would go into uh, schools and schools would come into the prisons, you know, to talk, to speak with uh, incar incarcerated uh, women. Um, you know, that's a heavy question. I just, you know, it takes a village. It takes a village, you know, to bring about healing. So, you know, uh, and this forum here, I, I know, you know, it, it's part of it, having a conversation about it. But I really, I don't have an answer to that. You know, I don't have, I don't have an answer to that. Uh, I have experiences that I feel uh, have helped me to come to wellness, you know, in my mind, you know, but at an early age, I can remember when I was two years old and traumatized, you know, um, and, and I think that it, it took me on a road of wanting to know me, you know? All I can say, Sam, is that each individual has to find it within themselves, what they can do to help uh, heal our, ourselves, our community, our world. And conversation, having these conversations is, I mean, it's, it's the best. That's the only answer that I have. You know, Thanks. I keep doing the work that, that I do when when I'm when it's put before me. So. Thank you, Ms. Paul. Uh, Douglas, uh, same question to you. How could mental health treatment early on prevent pathways to incarceration for people with mental health disorders? And then I'm gonna come to you, Ellen. So, man, I would say like how we prevent it. I think that is what would prevent it. You know what I mean? Like I have an experience of the criminal system in two different two different states and the way that they're addressed are entirely different. When I was younger, I, I have a rough life, man, like extremely rough life. But when I was learned how to actually uh, cope with my emotions and cope with the extremes that I was going through, it really helped me to learn to process what was going on and not act out as much. You know what I mean? The fact is that a lot of people that act out and end up in, incarcerated, especially as a youth, are abandoned. They're abandoned, they're neglected, they're treated poorly, they're in the foster care system. There's a whole bunch of different things of where you can see like they've just been failed over and over and over and over again. But the person that cannot fail the kid is the kid himself. And if you teach that kid how to like make wise decisions, do you know what I mean? The make wise decisions and rise above the, of the, of the struggles, things like that, that's, that will change it. You know what I mean? So the fact that it's like, so yeah, that would absolutely change it. Uh, rehabilitation more than punitive because the punitive system just simply is not working, man. You know what I mean? Like, it's just not working. I'm, I I don't have kids, but imagine like your nieces, your nephews getting locked up because somebody didn't give them a chance. 
You know what I mean? Like they're just, it, and cars are mental health work for children is where it really needs to be. So they can understand how to love themselves when nobody is loving them, when everybody is throwing them out the door and they can learn to understand they still are worth it. So when you can start to address like mental health issues such as depression, um, just whatever they, whatever their mental health issue is, PTSD is probably one of the bigger ones. You know what I mean? They'll know how to cope with it and move forward in life. So, yeah. Thank you, Douglas. Uh, uh, Ellen, I uh, want to come to you with the same question. How, how could mental health treatment early on prevent pathways to incarceration for people with mental health disorders? What Doug said, um, yeah, ab absolutely. Um, Doug touched on, on PTSD and trauma, as did Ms. Polk. And I think that many of us have heard, you know, hurt people hurt people. And when that harm isn't addressed, then oftentimes people continue to, to harm and heal people heal people. And so when, when you don't have that, any way to sort of heal that harm and to address traumas that you've experienced as a child, then, you know, you continue to behave in ways that we consider society as acting out. And really the acting out is asking for help. But when people mm -hmm. aren't providing support and aren't providing compassionate, empathetic care, then that leads to, you know, other behaviors that our society responds to, as Doug said, by punitive, a punitive system and by incarceration. And not only do I think that mental health support early on could, could prevent incarceration, but I think that also it could prevent recidivism. We have many, many people who are identified just during the pandemic, 3,500 people coming home and may you know, have unstable housing depending on their situation, reconnecting with family members, dealing with a lot of transitional needs. And if we don't have services that are set up to address mental health needs, then that that's problematic. We can't heal when we don't address those issues. And so really um, providing access to mental health is, is critical for people's healing process. Right. Thank you, Ellen. Uh, and, and I'd like to speak on that a little bit myself, Sam, because I'm going through, I mean, I have a 16 year old son and, uh, you know, he's on ankle monitor and we're dealing with these services and due to the pandemic, um, you know, so the services just aren't there, um, you know, and and it's this is something that I'm struggling with currently, you know, I, you know, I may have all these great things going in, going on in my life, but this plays a large part on my mental health um, as well as his, you know, he's been diagnosed with uh, um, ODD and st uh, things of that nature, ADHD. And, and now substances have come, come into play. 16 years old, he's got an ankle monitor on um, and, you know, and my big thing was, I'm going to break the cycle. I'm going to break the cycle when I came home, you know, a little over nine years ago. And um, the fact of the matter is the cycle hasn't been broken, um, you know. And so the only thing I could do is love him where he's at, meet him where he's at. Um, and, you know, the, I know that a lot of systems look at him as the resource child. And, and I speak to him. I'm like, this is your narrative. You're, you're writing your own story right now. Um, and what I could tell you is not everybody's because he's well aware of what's gone on with me and stuff. I came home when he was six and, uh, you know, and it's like I, the cycle hasn't been broken, but I, I could definitely show him that there's a different way to live. Um, so, I mean, that's important for me. Absolutely. Thank you, Gary. Thank you for sharing that, brother. And uh, definitely if there are ways that we can support. Let us know. Uh, always standing with you. Um, and so, so this is for the entire panel. And I'm, I'm going to go first uh, up to you, Douglas, and, and ask, uh, how can mental health services and resources be improved inside prisons, jails, and detention centers? Man, I would say, uh, I, I would, I would say that, like how they can be approved, honestly, is to take it seriously. You know, and, and that's probably one of the biggest things is it's, I mean, mental health in, in society, especially, especially for men, is something we honestly brush under the rug. 
If you're a man, you're supposed to be strong. If you're a man, you're supposed to just shrug it off, whatever. You're not man enough. You're not owning it. You're not being real with yourself. All of that comes in the lines of being, you know, um, of mental health when it comes to men. You know what I mean? I think it just needs to be taken seriously. There needs to be a real investment into it that is applied and implemented. And the fact is, is I think a lot of people don't know how, how it would make economical sense, but it absolutely would make all the economical sense, especially if you're looking into professional de development and intellectual property and things of that nature. But I think how it can be, how it definitely can be approved upon is simply just taking it seriously, man. Get people in there that are actually passionate about it. Don't get people that are looking for kickbacks with the pharmaceutical connect or something like that. You know what I mean? Um, that's how it can definitely be improved upon. Like the, the work is there, the heart is there. This organization is a fantastic example of that. There's many, there's other organizations out there also, but like just definitely take it seriously. Absolutely. Thank you, Douglas. Uh, Ms. Polk, same question to you. How can mental health services and resources be improved inside prisons, jails, and detention centers? More volunteers, volunteers from the community. Um, this is close to my heart because this is where uh, re-entry begins is in the prisons and the jails, okay? Um, for youth and, and adults to have more people from the community come in and show that love and give that love that really everyone is looking for. Everyone has PTSD, you know, to some degree. But I believe that, you know, when the community gets, gets involved the way they used to, we used to have tons. Well, I know in Hawaii, there are always been, and this is what helped me, okay? Volunteers that come in. I mean, you don't necessarily, everybody's gone through something in their lives, you know, that makes us, that ties us together of being human. So I believe that re-entry starts in the prisons with love, people sharing love and, and changing the way that prisons operate. You know, when I first went to prison, they told me, oh, you don't have any rights. I said, oh no, you're wrong. The only right I don't have is to walk out that door, but I got every right that I want to have. There may be consequences to those rights that I choose, but I have them. So I believe that, you know, re-entry starts in the prisons before anyone comes out, you know, because it can be overwhelming when, when you hit the streets and you have absolutely, you know, you got to depend on where you're going to go. Thank and the community, community, the community coming in and volunteering and showing that love and giving that love, you know, and taking the programs themselves. That's Absolutely. available in prisons. Thank you, Ms. Pope. Uh, Isaac, same question to you. How can mental health services and resources be improved inside our prisons, jails, and detention centers? Yes, sir. So like the last two speakers, I think very well said, uh, funding of course is uh, very necessary, but also funding the right people and uh, also having it start from the inside, inside the prisons. I never went to prison, but uh, so, you know, I don't know what that looks like, but having, you know, having the success be uh, brought upon by the people who wanna make a change and make the growth and reciprocate that to, you know, their community and obviously inside the prisons. All right. Thank you, Isaac. Uh, the other thing I'd like to add to that is uh, inside prisons, there's a negative connotation with, with mental health treatment. Like, so therapy. So you, it's almost impossible to find one-on-one -on -one therapy when you're incarcerated. And then if you do seek it out, then you fall into these categories like EOP, triple CMS, all these different categories. And then when you go, if you're a lifer and you go to, before the board, there's this negative stereotype that goes with it. But in fact, which, which how it should be looked at is you sought out help to help you cope with an abnormal environment that crushes you. And you should be applauded for that. Uh, and so I think the negative connotation, the stigma that's attached to mental health treatment needs to be removed. And we need to really work on, on normalizing this, not just inside prisons and jails, but in our communities, especially black and brown communities. It's not a negative thing. Everyday life will kick your ASS. 
And it's better to have someone to talk to and someone that can give you the tools to navigate everyday life. Because everyday life will keep you down with his boot on your neck if, if you allow it to. And so having someone to help you navigate those difficult things, whether it's a breakup, loss of a job, uh, death in the family, all these different things that we experience as human beings that we have to navigate every day. And when we navigate these things, it's always good to have the tools to be able to navigate them. So re being, being willing to reach out has to be normalized. I think both inside and outside the institutions. Uh, I, uh, Ellen, I uh, want to ask you this. We often talk about how trauma and PTSD can impact our overall health and well-being. How is this particularly critical when discussing mental health amongst currently and formerly incarcerated people and access to mental health services? Thank you for that question, Sam. I think you know, we, we talked a lot about trauma earlier and you know, people oftentimes who are, are in prison may have experienced trauma early on in, in their life prior to going to prison and then are in a traumatizing environment. And even if you haven't experienced trauma prior to being incarcerated, that is a traumatizing experience in and of itself and being disconnected from family members, not having the support you need. We've already touched on a lack of mental health resources and any sort of mental health services inside. And to then return into the community and be dealing with processing so many of these, these traumas, it's so critical to be able to talk through those things Ms. Pope mentioned at the beginning of this conversation that mental health to her is processing, is thinking about what she's thinking about. And so often when we are dealing with a trauma, it's easy to avoid. It's easy not to tap in and kind of process the things that we're dealing with. But if we keep stuffing, we're not ever going to process those traumas and those, those experiences. And we continue to let those live out on the people who are close to us. And so for people who are returning home and maybe experiencing post-incarceration syndrome and dealing with a lot of the trauma that they've experienced inside, it's so critical to be able to heal from that and to be able to connect in a community like ARC and to connect with other people who have those experiences and to process that trauma. Thank you, Ellen. And, and and for those of you that don't know, to our listeners, if you have time, Google post-incarceration syndrome to get a better understanding. Though it's not currently listed in the Diagnostic Statistics Manual, I think sometime in the near future it will be because it's real. It, it's, 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 it's real. And if you talk to anyone who has done any amount of time in, 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 in our system, uh, they'll tell you that there are picks, as we call them, that we experience after being incarcerated. Uh, uh, when, when I ask uh, Ms. Polk, and I'm going to ask the entire panel, uh, this, uh, except for Ellen, uh, how has having mental health support since coming home contributed to your overall well-being, Ms. Pope? Um, tremendously. You know, um, my agent suggested that I take an anger management uh, course, and, and and I attend uh, ARC's anger management every Tuesday with a Chloe as the facilitator. And I found, you know, in the beginning, I was like, oh, are you, are you, are you real? You know, I mean, I've been incarcerated over 30 years and I've had, you know, from A to Z, uh, mental health, uh, anger management, uh, whatever groups are available, I've taken advantage of it. However, once I started uh, the uh, anger management group every Tuesday, I look forward to sharing. I look forward to listening. I mean, it's, you know, it's something I look forward to every week. So I believe that it's imperative that we tap in, tap into what's available out here. Life doesn't stop just because we're not incarcerated. Thinking doesn't stop just because we're not incarcerated. Things continue. We could continue to grow and move forward. So we have to continually feed ourselves positive tools that are going to assist us in moving forward and being of help 
in our community, in our world. So I think it's, it's vital. Thank you, Ms. Pope. Uh, Gary, how, how important has it been having mental health support since coming home? How much has it contributed to your overall uh, well-being? Uh, mental health has been huge since coming home. Uh, you know, I can't, like I said earlier, I came home a little over nine years ago. The system has changed a whole lot since then. Um, but when I came home, it was, uh, you know, the first thing for me was staying free of substances and things of that nature. And then, uh, um, then it was all about, you know, I said mind, body and soul. Then it was all about body. Like I, I was able to do burpees for three hours and, and a pool of, <laughs> pool of sweat. Um, you know, the last two years have been the really most taxing once I got into grad school. Uh, I mean, I'm not, I, once I came home, it was like everything, once I took care of the substances and, and some of the uh, male toxicity and stuff like that, everything else kind of came easy as far as education uh, went. You know, there was a hard class here or there. But once I hit that next level of graduate school, um, I remember when I started this program, I walked into the office over there at Sacramento State and I said, I don't think I could do this. And they're like, what do you got to worry about? Um, and I was real open with Ellen and um, and my field liaison and stuff. And, you know, and, and I really had to ask myself that question, like, uh, you know, how important is this to me? You know, because I'd never had student debt or anything up until grad school. Um, you know, so I, I've got to give a tremendous amount of uh, um, thanks to the support that I was able to receive from the um, ARC's mental health team, um, mainly Ellen when uh, we were running prior to the pandemic, um, Project the Project Rebound family, and my wife. Uh, she works in the field as well, right? She's a, a she's a counselor at a methadone clinic and that, I mean, you're in the trenches there. Um, so, and it's just being able to process all those things that are coming at you and, um, and, and turn it into a success, uh, the best way you can. And not everything's going to end like that, you know, but, uh, um, being able to cope with also the downfalls and, and the successes and, and try to remain on that even level, you know, um, staying humble and uh you know but always trying to achieve more thank you gary thank you thank you uh, uh, douglas uh for you uh how has having mental health support since coming home contribute to your overall well-being i wouldn't have found my well-being if it wasn't for that after after my experience of being unlawfully incarcerated man and that's just facts you know and, I, and i'm extremely grateful for that because i came right it has been coming directly through arc you know, and um, it's it's that time of the, of what you're talking about, the post trip, the post incarceration syndrome, things like that. Like I experienced that heavily, you know what I mean? And for me, it's just it's really been in, in it's really just been about like opening up and then talking to somebody and being vulnerable, because even now that's still difficult to do. You know what I mean? So how has it contributed it, that there would be none, none of that, that recovery just. It's just it's imperative to heal from all the wounds that you're you're hit from of, of life trauma all up and down the field. Like you really need to let people into your life and and trust people to to hear your vulnerabilities and be willing enough and have enough. Like we'll just be completely transparent so you can actually heal through it, man. So, yeah. Thank you, Douglas. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, I'd like to give each one of you a moment uh, for closing thoughts. Uh, and so uh would like for you, Issa, why why is it important to take care of your mental health and what does it look like for you? Uh like uh, so let's start with uh Ms. Polk. Uh please take a minute. Why is it important for you to take care of your mental health and what does that look like to you? I mean, we, you told us the favorite part. Now tell tell us what does that look like to you? Uh take a minute to do that, please. Well, if I don't take care of my mental health, um, the shackles that have been on me would come back. Um, I wouldn't be able to uh, take care of the recipients that God has put within uh, my life. 
also my mother. I wouldn't be able to uh, to take care of her. So, you know, it's very important that I continue to heal, to listen, to share, uh, to do the work, you know, not just uh, because with, without action from me, without doing the work, there's no healing. And healing continues until I'm not here anymore. Thank you, Ms. Pope. Thank you so much. Uh, Isaac, for you, uh, why is it important to take care of, of, of our mental health and what does that look like for you? Yes, sir. First of all, I just want to say thank you to the ARC family. Uh, like Douglas said, if it wasn't for ARC, uh, I wouldn't have the mental health support that I have now and I wouldn't feel more like a whole person than I have ever in my life. Uh, for me, it's just about finding that inner peace, uh, staying active, uh, keeping my faith active, uh, and putting in the work for sure, you know, through the ups and downs and uh, staying connected, you know, staying with my loved ones, taking time for myself and, uh, you know, trying to be better for not only myself, but the people around me. Thank you, Isaac. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Gary, for you, uh, why is it important to take care of our mental health and what does that look like for you? So for me, um, a lot of it has been with a family therapy uh, as far as things going with my son and everything else. Um, you know, but as soon, now that I'm graduated, now that I have a little bit of free time on my schedule, um, getting therapy for myself as well. Um, if I'm not working on myself, how good am I going to be to others if I'm carrying, you know, this baggage with me? Um, you know, I got to be able to let them process things. And uh, in order to have in order to do that, I got to have my own uh, emotions, my own house in order. So um, getting therapy for myself is also uh, will play an important factor in me moving forward. Thank you, Gary. Ellen, same question. Why is it important for us to take care of our mental health? And what does that look like for you? I, I already know you were down here. Uh, of I think two weeks ago, a week or so ago, and you and Bikila did a 5K run. Uh, I'm glad you didn't invite me because I don't think I could make 5K right now, <laughs> maybe one. Uh, but, uh, but what does that look like for you? Yeah, thank you for that question, Sam. And, and thank you again for this panel and for everyone's vulnerability. It really is powerful. And I think it's an incredibly important conversation, not just for Mental Health Awareness Month, but all year long. And as far as, as mental health for me, um, I mentioned really physical health, um, spiritual health, connection, making sure that I'm working out every day. Um, I go to therapy. People say, oh, don't you already know how to do that? No, therapists need therapists too. Um, a lot of us come to this field um, of social work uh, because of personal experiences that we've had. And as Gary mentioned, it's so important to process all of the different things that we're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis, all of our personal experiences, so that we can show up and be healers as well. So. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you so much. Uh, last but not least, Douglas, uh, why is it important for us to, to take care of our mental health and what does that look like for you? I'll say why, because it's growth. You know, one thing like people don't talk about enough is happiness requires growth. And you have to grow through the tough times. And if you're not growing through the tough times, you're really avoiding your happiness in so many different ways. I mean, there's lots of the reasons why, like, I don't know it all. You know what I mean? I, but there are people that know more about situations that I've never been in, being vulnerable for one of them. You know what I mean? Like fellowship, it's, uh, it, it's just essential. You know what I mean? And it feels good to feel good. You know, especially if you come through like, a lot of extremes, good things really look like negative things because you're thinking, wait, hold up, man. Like what, what kind of spin are you trying to do right now? You know what I mean? Like, and, and that takes, that takes time to, to learn and heal from all of the, the deep, like emotional traumas throughout your life that you encounter. It doesn't, you know what I mean? Like it's, yeah. So what mental health means, it means growth, man. It means I have a chance. It means I, I am able to contribute to the to the greater cause, because I think one of the biggest things I've learned about life is that really as much as we 
like we work on ourselves and stuff. It, life really isn't just about you, you know, and it's about us. It's about the collective. How can I contribute to the cause? And there's a lot of things I've learned, especially from ARC and different organizations where it's just like, wow, we're all in this together. So why not work together? So for sure. Thank you, Douglas. Thank you everyone for joining. As I told you before, we have some, incre some incredible, amazing human beings on this panel. Uh, please take care of yourself. Please take time for self-care. Understand how important it is for you and for those around you. Uh, the next week, uh, tune in so we can look back at the past year on the one year anniversary of George Floyd's death, uh, something we should never forget about and make sure that we continue to push for systemic change across our nation. Until then, everyone take care, God bless, and be safe. See you next week.